Well, we are in March, and my family being a combination of Irish and Jewish, we have both Purim, the Feast of Esther, Hebrew month of Adar, and we have, of course, St. Patrick's Day falling within a few weeks of each other. A very festal period marking the end of the winter, beginning of the spring to come shortly. Very exciting time of the year. Let's talk about St. Patrick. Padrik, Padrik. A major part of the problem concerning St. Patrick is we only have two documents that we know he wrote that can be historically attributed to him with any definite certitude. One is his letter to the soldiers of Caroticus, a kind of epistle, and the other is his declarations or known as his confessions. But let's begin at the beginning. There is abundant evidence that there were other Christians and other Christian evangelist missionaries in Ireland prior to Patrick. One of whom, slightly before Patrick, but contemporary with him, was Palladium, or Palladium, or Palladius, in some documentation, I believe. And it is possible that some of the oral history or tradition that was true of Patrick was conflated or mixed with Palladius or Palladium and some of Palladium with Patrick. We can only be sure of what is in his confessions or declarations or his epistle to the soldiers of Chronicus. There is even a dispute about where exactly Patrick was born. It was certainly in Roman Britain. However, some would say it was in the area of Dunbarton, southern Scotland, not far from Loch Lomond. Most would say it is in an area of England called Mercia or Cumbria along the northwest English coast. He was abducted and taken as a slave by Irish pirates sometime in the early 5th century. That's quite certain the early 5th century. Now let's go back to the time period in which Patrick lived, the early 5th century. It was the aftermath of Augustine's Platonizing Christianity as a Platonic faith, Hellenizing the church, under the influences of his mentors and influences such as Ambrose of Milan and Cyprian of Carthage, as we pointed out before. It was the time when Constantine, to try to stop the crumbling Roman Empire from imploding and fragmenting, he relocated his capital from Rome to Constantinople, modern Istanbul, bequeathing the imperial properties in Rome to the bishop in Rome. The primacy of the bishop in Rome as a pope had not been fully established, in fact, it was only embryonic, not even incipient, at that point. According to Eusebius, there were conflicting lists of who were the bishops in Rome in terms of their succession, ostensibly going back to Peter. It was all arbitrary, the final list that was agreed on by the Roman Church, and that was largely done for political reasons. It was at this time the Church began to merge with the state. Constantine had a political agenda. It was after Constantine, the Emperor Justinian began laying the real foundations of what would become the papacy. But this was before the papacy was institutionally established by Pope Gregory the Great, as he's called, or Gregory the First. So we're at an early stage. Roman Catholicism was in its very infancy at this particular point. It had not developed even its basic tenets and its basic structure. Those things were at a formative stage. The Greek Orthodox Church, of course, would eventually break from it. Nonetheless, that's what was going on. The Roman Catholic Church, as we know it, did not yet exist. In actual fact, the Roman Catholic Church, as we know it, did not actually 
fully exist as it would be today until the Council of Trent in the aftermath of the Reformation. But we're talking 4th century now. I'm sorry, we're talking 5th century now, early 5th century. Patrick was probably born late 4th century. In any event, he's abducted. By some historical tradition, his father had been a local official and some kind of a deacon, perhaps, with the church, while his grandfather was said to be a clergyman. Patrick himself was not a believer at the time of his abduction. During his abduction, when he was forced labor looking after cattle and things like this in Ireland, sometime at that point when he was praying for his freedom, his release, he came to some kind of a faith. Uh, was this regeneration? He didn't speak in those terms in his declarations per se, but he obviously came to believe it, at least intellectually. Patrick managed to get free after six years of servitude, made his way back to England or to his family, and at that point began to grow in his religious convictions, determined to return as a missionary to Ireland. Now we have to understand something. Monks at that time were not like monks as they are now. We're going back to an ancient Celtic tradition associated with people like Colum Kill, Columba, or Ninian, or the island of Iona off Scotland, or Lindisfarne in the north of England. They were different. These were the Irish monks who actually were preachers who re-evangelized much of Europe going down as far as the Bodensee, the Lake Constance, in southern Germany, such as Boniface, and to Cornwall, England, where many of the towns and cities in Cornwall, England, are to this day named after them, such as St. Earth and St. Ives and so forth. These monks were quite different. From an early stage, they had an interest in preserving manuscripts that were burned by the Vikings, so they kept the records of the canons of the church by hand copying. This was later continued by Augustinians and Franciscans and others, but essentially it was originally done by these primordial Irish monks. These Irish monks were communities, communities, and they were influenced by the desert fathers of Egypt. What happened at that time, after the aftermath of Constantine, was two things. The worldliness of the Greco-Roman civilization began to infiltrate the church along with the Hellenism and pagan influences. Additionally, Alexandria in North Egypt, at that time a Greek-speaking city, became an epicenter of Gnosticism and of cultural uh, cross-fertilization between even Buddhism, Buddhist monks arriving there from India, and Western Christendom and Judaism. It was there Philo wrote, it was there the proto-Gnosticism of Oregon came into play, followed, as we pointed out, by the Gnostics Basilides and Valentinus. The Desert Fathers wanted to retreat from the worldliness, forgetting the teaching of the New Testament, to be in the world but not of it, they went into the desert, into remote locations. This became prominent in the Eastern Roman Empire. Monks as we would know them today were begun by someone called Benedict, Benedict, the Benedictines, the Trappists, things like this. They came much, much later. Originally it was these communities who did not want to be contaminated with the world and who took refuge in remote areas of the desert. What the desert had been to the desert fathers, islands in the sea or peninsulas jettisoning out into the sea became to the Celtic monastic communities after the time of Patrick. That's what they were. Eventually, they began to take refuge as um, 
the influences of the world came into the church. At that time again, England being very much a part of the Roman Empire, and the north of England, the city of York, for whom New York is named, was for a two-year period the de facto capital of the Roman Empire, as it was Constantine's headquarters when he was a Roman general and first became emperor. Hence, although it was far from Rome, it was not a total outpost. It was something like San Francisco in the early 1800s. In between San Francisco and um, the Appalachian Mountains, there wasn't much there. It was a frontier. But San Francisco had been inhabited by the Spanish and had been a city for centuries by the time of the 19th century. Uh, well, that's the way York was. It was an outpost of civilization, even though it was separated by long distances from the other main cities of the Roman Empire situated around the Mediterranean and so forth. So this was the background of Patrick's time. Patrick goes back to Ireland and he encounters the polytheism of the Druids. The Druids were not just in Ireland. The Druids built Stonehenge. They were in Wales. They were elsewhere. They had barbaric religious practices based on idolatry and superstition and could be quite cruel. There was a fear of the Druid priests, a kind of Celtic shamanism where the people thought that these Druid priests had powers to curse the people and so forth, so there was a fear of them. As Roman Catholicism made inroads into the British Isles and into Ireland in time, which I will explain, this fear of the Druid priests <coughs> was put onto the Catholic priests. So the people feared the Catholic priests and did whatever the Catholic priests told them in rural Ireland. However, this took place after the time of Patrick. We should not confuse the time of Patrick with what followed. Ireland, known at that time as Hibernia, was never a part of the Roman Empire. The Romans didn't want it. They had built a wall to stop the Celts, the Picts and the Scots, from invading the north of England and attacking York. They built Adrian's Wall. They never conquered the Celts in the south, very south of England, that is the southwest Cornwall and adjacent areas. To this day, the people who live there, many of them, are actually Celts. They're not Anglo-Saxon. They have the Celtish dialect of Gaelic, as the Scottish have their dialect of Gaelic, as there's a Welsh language derived from Gaelic and Irish, spoken in the Aran Islands and in places called Gaeltex. But these people were seen as one people by the Romans. The Romans looked upon the Irish as particularly heathen, more so than the Picts and Scots, who they saw as heathen. They said of the Irish, or the Hibernians, all of their songs are sad and their wars are happy. Well, things have not changed much. The Romans did not have a lot of strategic or economic interest in Ireland. They just left them. Uh, you'll see like Galway in Ireland and Galloway in Scotland. They were almost one people. Certainly they were anthropological cousins. Now these Celtic tribes would fight each other. The Irish were fighting each other long before, long before the English invaded Ireland. Well, let's fast forward to someone called Augustine of Canterbury. Not Augustine of Hippo. We're talking much later now. We're talking up through the 7th century. He is sent from Rome by the papacy, the, again, early papacy, to bring the indigenous church of the British Isles under Rome. And he fails categorically. He was opposed by Anglo-Saxon kings and by the Celts, who had their own indigenous church. In Ireland, they would eventually have their own scriptures translated, called the Book of Kells. They were quite happy with what they had. So were the English, and Augustine failed. Later on, through political pressure, they caved in at a 
place called Whitby, the Council of Whitby. Ireland, however, did not. Whitby only affected primarily England. The Irish held out, particularly in the north. Fast forward to the aftermath of William the Conqueror. A Norman, a French-speaking Viking king, Henry II, he was not Anglo-Saxon, he was not English, ethnically. He was king of England, but not an ethnic Englishman. Henry II was threatened with excommunication by Pope Adrian IV if he did not invade Ireland and force Ireland under the Roman papacy, under the Pope. How did the English first come to invade Ireland? Well, the Pope sent them. That's how it happened. <coughs> Most people try to ignore this. Irish history is almost an absurd exercise in revisionism. The founders of later Irish republicanism, originally called the Home Rule Movement, Isaac Both, Napper Tandy, Charles Parnell, the author and clergyman of Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels. The founders of Irish republicanism and its um, harbinger, the Home Rule Movement, these people were all Protestant, not Catholic. Irish republicanism was a Protestant movement. They had a separate rebellion in 1790 of Catholic and Protestant together fighting the British. However, there had been another war in um, 1690. This had been with William of Orange, a Protestant Dutchman married to a Catholic who was blessed and supported by the Pope, who fought King James, who said, I will preserve the Protestant throne and constitution. Absurd. So you had William and Mary, his Catholic wife, fighting James II, who at one point had professed Protestantism but wasn't Catholic. This was a mere extension of a conflict that took place in Europe between France and the interests of the papacy, who would win? Two foreign kings having a war on Irish soil that largely had nothing to do with Ireland, per se, <coughs> culminating with the Battle of the Boyne, where it was re-identified as a Catholic against Protestant struggle. What is not taught in the Catholic schools in Ireland is that when King James won the Battle of the Boyne. The Pope celebrated it and proclaimed a ter diem with ringing of bells and so forth in Vienna. How does this relate to, to the Catholic tradition of Ireland centered around Patrick? The fact is, it is all revisionism. It has been reframed. <coughs> Patrick was not a Roman Catholic in the sense that we would think of Roman Catholicism today. It didn't exist yet in Ireland. It didn't exist yet in England. The papacy itself was in a formative stage. But the whole idea is Ireland, Catholic, English, Protestant, we have St. Patrick. This is nonsense. The Church of Ireland, which is Protestant, the Anglican Church, and the Eastern Orthodox Church all hold Patrick as a saint. Now, it was saint with small s. The Roman Catholic Church did not formally begin to even canonize people as saints at this point. They referred to any holy man or martyr as a saint within popular Christendom. He, he was never formally canonized at, at that early point. Nothing like that ever happened. Remember, the history of Ireland is a big whitewashed myth. The Orange Protestants don't want to recognize that the founders of Irish independence movement, Irish republicanism, the home rule movement were Protestant. They want to forget about Nepotandi and Charles Parnell and Sir Isaac Both and Wolf Tone all being Protestant. It was largely somebody called Daniel O'Connor who began making it an Irish Catholic movement at a later point. 
O'Connor provided a model for political organization that was imitated by Lenin in Russia. Quite a thing. The original Irish Republicans, such as Nepotandi and so forth, they were inspired by the American Revolution, who stood up against British rule. The author of the Irish Patriot Anthem, um, The Wearing of the Green, was somebody with a peculiar name for an Irishman, Dionysius Bulsasalt. But he would later immigrate to New York after writing The Wearing of the Green, and he worked as a composer and performer in the early, very early days of Broadway. And uh, he wrote, among other ditties, East Side, West Side, all around the town. Well, Trip the Light Fantastic on the sidewalks of New York, the same person. So you had this strong connection between Irish America and Ireland at a very early point that was reinforced in the aftermath of the Irish potato famine and the mass immigration that it engendered, and then later again following the Easter uprising, which I will not go into today in the uh, early 20th century. But the entire history, going back to Patrick, is a revisionist whitewash. There are things Protestants don't want to admit, and there are things Catholics don't want to admit, including it was the Pope who sent the English to invade Ireland to force the Irish people to come under the Roman Catholic papacy and system. We have to go back to the very beginnings, and even Patrick was not the beginning. There were other people significant in the development of Irish Christendom and Christianity. There was Bridget, there was certainly Colum Kill, there was Malachi, there were others. We're talking about Patrick now. When we read Patrick's confessions, or his declaration, and his letter or epistle to the soldiers of Chronicus. We see no mention of popes, purgatory, mass, mass cards, rosaries. None of that existed. None of it. None of it. These things came well after Patrick. They didn't even exist yet, per se. What it would eventually happen with the forced Catholicization of Ireland is the mixture of Druidism and Roman Catholicism. This was typical of what the Roman Catholic Church did everywhere, and eclecticism when they converted the pagans, supposedly. They would go to places where the female cult deities, such as the Sheila Nagig, or Erin, the Irish goddess, were worshipped, and they put a grotto of Mary on the same location. This kind of thing. Again, the fear of the Druid priests was transferred into Romanism with their clergy, as opposed to the uh, priesthood of all believers. So Patrick did not know Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism, as it has evolved in Ireland, or as it has evolved generally, did not yet largely exist. It was very incipient at that particular time in the early uh, 5th century, late 4th century when he was born. A number of myths surround Ireland, one of which is that he drove the snakes out of Ireland after he was attacked by them. Snakes in biblical typology are metaphors for the spiritual seduction of Satan. He did indeed drive the snakes out symbolically in that he opposed the polytheism and pagan beliefs of the Druid priests. In that sense, he drove the snakes out. Jesus called the religious leaders of his day, who were deceiving the people, a generation of vipers. It was a common way for missionaries and evangelists to speak when encountering pagan priesthoods. Again, this was before the Roman Catholic Church developed its own pagan priesthood, which we have today. But snakes are not biologically or zoologically indigenous to Ireland. There were no snakes there. They don't live there. There's only two species of snakes, extremely rare, even in England. And they're almost extinct, but there were never any in Ireland. 
wrong climate. Another myth that he held up a shamrock to teach the Trinity, and that was his idea. This began with Tertullian in North Africa in the 300s. He held up a branch with three twigs on it. It was simply the way that all missionaries and all evangelists taught these things. Patrick may have used a little shamrock. A shamrock is a small three-leaf clover that grows in Ireland. Uh, it's kind of almost evergreen. He held it up. He may have done that. But that was just the way all missionaries and evangelists tried to explain the difference between the triunity of the Godhead and polytheism. So many myths. And again, much of what is ascribed or attributed to Ireland may be true of Palladium. Palladius, the two, there's something called the Two Patrick Theory. I've been to where he's supposedly buried, along with Columba and Bridget, in um, County Down in Ireland, but nobody's really sure. Nobody's really sure. We know he spent most of his time originally in the north and in the west of Ireland, more remote areas at that particular time. So, here we have Patrick. Patrick was accused of some kind of financial impropriety by Croticus, the military commander, and he responded to it in his letter. Um, eventually, he excommunicated Croticus, and he compared Croticus to holding the beliefs of the pagan Picts P-I-C-T-S, in Scotland, another tribal, very warlike people were in Scotland who opposed the Romans and so forth. Uh, there were also similarly still heathen Celtic tribes in the highlands of Scotland at that particular point, and Patrick associated Chronicus with them in his letter to the uh, followers and soldiers, actually, men-at-arms of Chronicus. That is what we know about Patrick. That is all we know about Patrick. The rest is oral tradition written down at the earliest 150 years later. 150 years later. What we can conclude is this. There was a Patrick. He was either from the north of England or possibly, possibly, was today called Strathclyde in Scotland. He was abducted into slavery. He escaped after some kind of a conversion experience. He returned to Ireland. He did not know Roman Catholicism. As we know it, Roman Catholicism did not exist. He was heralded as a holy man by the Eastern Orthodox Church, by the Anglican Church, by the Church of Ireland, and by Roman Catholicism. They all co-equally claim him. He's not a Roman Catholic saint per se. He was never canonized. They didn't canonize saints in those days, actually. Nonetheless, let's look. The only canonized saints were the ones who were named in the New Testament, such as the apostles, Mary, the mother of Jesus. That was the canon, was scripture. The church claimed no authority to add to the canon of scripture at that early point. That came with the further development of the Roman Catholic apostasy and system of heresy and so forth. Well, what else can we say about Patrick? Not much else, but he established these monastic communities. However, these were not monks in the sense of we think of monks today, of the Benedictine tradition with the offices and all this tonsorial rites and all these things copied from paganism. There was none of that. Uh, there were male monks and female monks, but these things had been transferred from Alexandria to the Eastern Church northward and uh, were largely, largely influenced, at least in their concept, by Buddhism, this idea of cloisterism. Now, the Irish Celtic monks were never fully cloistered. They didn't hide from the world completely. They were active preachers. They were involved in the communities. 
we can think of these monasteries more as communities, more as communities. All of these other things were written later. All of these other institutional practices of Roman Catholicism in which they tried or attempted post facto and posthumously to, pay, to place Patrick into are nonsense. They have no basis in historical reality. None. That is the real Patrick. That is the real Patrick. He's an adopted son of Ireland. He was not a born Irish. He was not a born Irishman, although he may have been a Celt had he been from Scotland particularly. Um, but he was not a native son of Ireland or anything like it. He was taken there forcibly and returned with what he believed to be a missionary calling. He did not introduce Christianity to Ireland. It was already there, particularly along the Irish Sea coast opposite Britain. Therefore, Patrick ventured to the north and to the west, which were further from Britain, which had not been evangelized and not heard the gospel. And, of course, his encounters with the Druids and the priests of the Druids were almost certainly true. This is the real Patrick. This is what we know about him. This is pretty much all we know about him. When you see this guy with the crozer holding up a big shamrock, shamrocks are little, <laughs> wearing a mitre and a green uh, Amis Alb Sinctus Stole Vestible Chasuble, the Chasuble, the Roman Catholic Chasuble, a green one with a gold cross. People didn't wear those things then. Chasubles had been the vestments of the pagan Roman priesthood in the pantheon of Rome, uh, the Roman Catholic Church copied it. Patrick would have known none of that nonsense. It didn't even exist yet. Roman Catholicism had not come to Ireland and did not fully grab Ireland until the 8th century. I'll say it again. In Britain, it took root in the 7th. It did not take root in Ireland until the 8th century. The Irish always resisted Roman Catholicism. Always. Always. Henry VIII, of course, invaded Ireland and tried to impose his version of Protestantism, Anglicanism, on Ireland in a later military conflict that continued with his daughter Elizabeth I. But let's understand something. Henry was an Anglo-Catholic. Henry opposed the Reformation. Henry was given the title Defender of the Faith by the Pope, despite the fact that he's responsible for the death of 74,000 of his own people. He tried to engage Erasmus of Rotterdam to oppose Luther. Henry opposed the Reformation. He was called the Defender of the Faith by the Catholic Church, only when for political reasons he was not given a dispensation or an annulment by the Pope to marry Catherine of Oregon, um, from Catherine of Oregon, sorry, to remarry another woman looking for a male heir. Did he break with the Roman Church? It was all political. He was a Catholic in his theology. He accepted sacramentalism, Mary veneration, and so forth. Uh, again, this whole thing of Catholic, Irish, Protestant, British, the invader, it is all a convoluted nonsense. It just did not happen like that. Orange Protestants don't want to admit it. Roman Catholics don't want to admit it. But it is the truth. This long series of myths that has framed Irish ecclesiastical history came out of a place called Armagh, Armagh, Armagh still being the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland and is in the north. These problems continue to the present day with the legacy or the uh, debauchery of a place called Maynooth near Dublin. They had to rewrite Irish history 
and they had to rewrite the Christian history of Ireland for political reasons. So that is exactly what happened. And they began rewriting it with Patrick. We must distinguish between the real Patrick, Padrig, and the others. Now, Patrick wrote not in the Irish language. He may have learned Irish and spoke Gaelic, but he largely wrote in Old Latin and in the Vulgate. He wrote in Old Latin and in the Vulgate of Jerome. That does show that um, he certainly was not a native Irish speaker or anything like that, that the scriptures did not at that time exist in the Irish language. But it also shows that he followed a combination of Western and Eastern traditions. From the Eastern ecclesiastical tradition was the concept of monasticism. From the Western one was the Vulgate of Jerome. And why wouldn't he? When you had the Latin-speaking metropolis, the capital of the Northern Empire, and for two years the capital of the empire, when Constantine as a general became emperor in the city of York, which is not that far from where Patrick was said to be born in Mercia. Uh, that is essentially what happened. That is the actual background. That's all anyone knows. The rest is myth, fairy tale, and revisionism. Happy St. Patrick's Day to my Irish friends and cousins. Remember, as John Lennon once sang, Ireland for the Irish, not for London or for Rome. There was an indigenous Irish church based on the Book of Kells long before Protestantism and Catholicism drenched the soil of Ireland in blood, a tragedy that has gone on to the present day. It should never have happened, and it does not need to happen now. Ireland has always been a religious country. <coughs> Very similar to Israel. Religion is not the solution to Ireland's problem. Religion is Ireland's problem. Jesus Christ is the solution. They need to go back to the Book of Kells. They need to go back to the simple principles of the faith recorded in Patrick's declarations. They need to go back to New Testament Christianity. They need to go back before Ignatius of them. Sorry about that. They need to go back before Augustine of Canterbury. <coughs> go back before Whitby. They need to go back before all of that and just go back to the New Testament. I'm happy to say <coughs> that while the political, cultural, and religious influences of Roman Catholicism is declining rapidly in Ireland among younger generations, that so-called religious vocations at Maynooth are disintegrating and have disintegrated rapidly in the maze of pedophile scandal, where every bishop, every single bishop in Ireland has been caught protecting pedophile sex criminal priests and nuns at the expense of not protecting the children of Ireland. The Roman Catholic Church has lost its grip on the souls of the people. Cults are growing, new age is growing, atheism is growing. But so is an indigenous Irish body of Christ that is neither Catholic nor Protestant. Unfortunately, a lot of the poison of the money preachers and the new apostolic reformation and even a degree of ecumenism is getting into Ireland via America and other places. Yet there's a growing contingent of solid believers with some good Irish pastors saved out of Catholicism or mainstream Protestantism, who know the real Jesus. May God continue to work in Ireland among the Irish people. I've had the privilege and blessing of going to the land of my maternal ancestors many times. We have a small satellite branch of Moriel in Ireland. We do an annual conference in Ireland, and God is indeed working there. 
pray for the salvation of Ireland. We need an Ireland that is neither Protestant nor Catholic. That has been a big problem. Traditionally, the gospel was identified with Protestantism and always had political baggage with it. That needed and needs to end. All of that needs to end. And praise God, it is ending. Pray for the salvation of the Irish. Pray for the growth of the body of Christ in Ireland, both numerically and spiritually. And pray that the poison of American money preachers and new apostolic reformation apostates is kept out of Ireland. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much. Once again, to our Irish friends and our Irish American friends, our Irish Canadian friends, our Irish Australian friends, our Irish British friends, happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you so much. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.